So we're just heading in to the Tarshan Temple, very close to Valletta. It's only 300 meters away from the Hypogeum, which is pretty amazing in itself. So it's probably related to that amazing underground complex. So these are just some of the megalithic blocks, just uh, obviously came from Tarshan Temple. Some of these incredible bowls as well, and altars in the background. You can see evidence here, this beautiful relief carving on this particular pillar here. One of the beautiful spirals, which we can actually see close up. I want to get a nice angle on this. So you can see the beautiful craftsmanship. That work here. Pretty stunning. These beautiful little bowls. Well, quite big bowls, really. That's a plan of the temple itself. So this is where we're gonna go into and have a good look around. So just on the entrance here, just inside, is one of these sort of spherical stones. It looks a bit rough. They say these were used to roll the main stones on. Again, this one looks a bit big for that, so it could have had some other purpose. Uh, since I was here last time, they've kind of put all this uh, down, uh, which is kind of this huge walkway around the whole site. And so they kind of control where you go a little bit, which is fine, I guess. And there's just one block there. You can just see that over on the right hand side, probably part of some temple. Obviously, they're digging something here, which does suggest there was a lower level here. And of course, we have our cat guardian looking after the site. Every single site we've been to, we've got one of our cat guardians. There's quite a lot of these spheres, look at them. And so they do suggest that these were used for rolling the stones. They could have had some more ceremonial purpose. You can see some of the huge megalithic blocks here, some that are broken. Now this place almost got destroyed when they were excavating, well they weren't really excavating, they were just pillaging the site before the First World War, just after maybe. Here we go, there's another huge block here. This is probably about 12 feet long. Look at these ones. These are almost like a retaining wall, this whole area here. And these must be in excess of 10 to 20 tons, some of these. Obviously over there, we've got the main temple, which we're gonna walk into and have a careful look around. Just a first glance, just you know, taking a walk around the, the first part of the temple as we approach it. Uh, I have to say it, it reminds me of Gebekli Tepe when you're, you're walking around the wooden walkway and you're looking down at the site. It's the same kind of structure. Uh, I wonder if, again, there are connections here. Even over here, you can see these huge blocks that make up the outside wall. And again, this is what we, we found at the site yesterday, Mandura Temple where we actually find evidence of, there's like a facing rock and then one on its side, uh, and then they alternate around the temple. We do find that here. And also on this stone here, which looks like one of the main stones, there's two huge cut marks, which is something we find on many of the other sites around here, and obviously on other sites around the world, including Gebekli Tepe. And just down here, you can see the way that something's been carved out of that stone quite dramatically. And I wonder if that's another serpent carving, sort of rough edge of some kind of serpent carving. And even on that stone there, you can see holes in it as well. So they're obviously, you know, this is part of the tradition here. But some of these blocks here are just huge. These must weigh in excess of 20, maybe 40 tons, some of them. And you can just start to see one of the spirals over the back there the quadruple spiral, the one that looks almost identical to the one we see at Tiwanaku in Bolivia. Even on top of some of these stones here, you can sort of see some kind of like square marks where it's almost like a sort of very slim, very shallow uh, mortise and tenon joint, which is what we find at Stonehenge. Interestingly, this roof here, you can see the way it very much kind of leans inwards, which is a classic thing we find in all the Malta uh, temples is that they kind of had some kind of domed roof on them. And this just shows you an example of that. And you can see how precision cut these are and they're placed together with such accuracy. You can barely get a credit card or a bit of paper between them.
Just in front of us here, this is the East Temple. Obviously, these are the South Temples over there. But this looks, apparently, they say it's much more simple. There's less work done on it, but to me, it does look pretty impressive still with the, the megalithic, especially the curving blocks there. I mean, look at these. I mean, they've kind of cut these perfectly into curved, you know, um, edges. And they have the strange cut marks on the stone there as well. These are just some of the small little underground caves we find at the back of the temple here. Now, remember, this is only 300 meters away from the hypogeum. So I wonder if it's connected underground at all. It should, surely it could be, because the hypogeum is a vast underground temple cave complex. Just around the edge here, you can see some sort of unused stones that were obviously originally part of the temple. I wonder if these have any significance. And then you get some of the spherical stones as well. This is the earliest part of the temple, 3600 BC, contemporary with Gigantia on Gozo. You see this huge block here, which obviously is one that maybe has fallen over, but there's these huge cut marks in, probably like almost a foot wide each. A very small circular temple there. All these blocks lying just on the edge of the temple do suggest these were huge uprights which we find at Mandra and Hagar Kim and they've been toppled over. Um, obviously the lower stones the or square stones still exist but these ones fascinate me because these are multi-ton blocks at least 20 to 40 tons a piece. Mysterious stone working technique we just know nothing about here from around 3000 BC. Over there we can see evidence of cut marks, huge cut marks. The one on the bottom there looks like it's a hole that goes all the way through. these cut marks just on these two entrance stones here. There's three just there. And if we look at this one, there's three there as well. They almost match up, so it does suggest there was something going between them, or it could have been some other purpose we know nothing about. See the thickness of the paving slabs, it's probably about three feet thick. So there's, this whole floor was done with huge megalithic slabs. It was pretty amazing, really. I mean, they were really, they really went to town and they really wanted it a certain way. They weren't cutting corners. They were, well, they were cutting lots of corners. Obviously, you can see the perfect cuts here, but they were making just a precision engineered temple space, or it could have had some other practical purpose. Again, you can see one of the blocks here how thick it is. The way these, these blocks over the top just rest perfectly. It's almost polygonal. It's almost like what we see in Peru and Bolivia. And here we have the entrance to another temple. And just down there, this is actually a double spiral which has been badly worn. So there's not much left to see of it. And this is one of this entrance steps. And right below us, we have one of the bowls. And over here, we see, see, see more evidence of these incredible cut marks almost like bowls chiseled out, or almost machined out, it looks like. And this is just one of the reconstructed huge bowls they have in the temple here. So what we're seeing here inside this sort of cut off temple, this curved line here is actually the remains of relief carvings of bulls facing each other. And below that, we have this strange entrance here. And there's even some kind of well here, which people have been throwing money into, obviously, to make wishes of good luck. So that these two large stones had two large bulls 
in relief carving on them facing each other which is very similar to what we find we've seen every, things like that at Chetel Hoyak in Turkey and obviously we find that kind of thing at Gobekli Tepe and at some sites in Peru as well so uh, is that a kind of tradition of the ancient megalith builders all around the world like a mini Stonehenge lintel more of the sort of strange kind of almost serpentine cut marks. These do look like the sort of skin of a snake, which maybe is what was going on here. There was like a, this was like a serpent temple. And again, we have one of these portal stones. This is one piece of rock that you climb through to enter possibly another world. It's the way they saw it anyway. And again, this stone here, this is one of the, it's a huge step stone this that leads to this temple but actually if you look carefully you can see this has got beautiful spiral stonework on which is kind of hidden behind this so this wooden kind of stairway but this is this is one of the ones that was actually this is just a copy but the original is actually in the museum which um, we'll, we'll edit into this so you can have a look at it so that's what it did look like and that's what it looks like now. So here's one of these huge bowls we find here at Tarshan. Uh, these have been found at other sites, obviously, in the area. And these do remind me, this whole site actually reminds me of uh, Newgrange in Nauth in Ireland. It has these bowls, it had, has the cut marks, and obviously it has the spirals as well. So there's a lot of similarities here. So here are replicas of the quadruple spirals that we find here at Tarshan. You can almost see um, the resemblance to the ones at Tiwanaku. And right above it, there's some kind of niche, like a little entrance, which is again, almost identical to what we find at Tiwanaku in Bolivia. Is there really a connection here between these two sites on different sides of the world? It's a whole array of spirals here. The originals are in the museum and also the goddess figure, which would have stood about three or four meters tall, which could be a representation of Sansuna, the giant goddess of ancient Gozo and possibly Malta, who's said to have built the temples. The originals in the museum, but look, what do they look like? They look like abstract H's, not dissimilar to what we find on the T pillars at Gebekli Tepe. And then we have the kind of wavy, almost like almost like they could be scales, they look more like water, which is reminiscent of what we've got around the edge here. It looks like a watery kind of waves shaping the top of the stones at the temple here. So it's very strange. You can see this beautiful stonework here. These are all kind of replicas, but again, it's still worth seeing how they would have looked in situ. And again, we have more spirals here. Beautiful carvings. And here we have these kind of entrance stones to this particular temple that have this beautiful relief on them. The original ones of these, which is shows you the relief animals on them. So I do question the antiquity of this site. Is it contemporary or is it soon after Gobekli Tepe? Are there connections here? Because actually in this temple as well, this is where they found the boat carvings that suggest there was a Neolithic or Bronze Age movement around the world uh, using navigation. Here's just an artist's impression of what was carved onto these stones and you can see perfect boats carved onto them. This is what the stones used to look like. So just behind me here there's a what there were two stone pillars that are now in the, in the entrance area where you buy your tickets which actually have carvings of boats on them which suggest that they were navigators going way back to the Neolithic period which is possibly the earliest representations of boats in the world. Uh, so we're looking at potentially 3600 BC, but more likely it was in the later Bronze Age period, which is what uh, the official stance is on it. This looks very interesting. This is like a sort of curved shaped stone that is just now lying on the ground. It could just be due to massive weathering, but it could have been a, a huge upright stone. Again, and again, we find these sort of uh, facade stones here, but this originally was, did look something like this, and I would imagine that this stone here, that's now just left on the ground, was actually up there, and it was the main lintel 
entrance to the main temple. And you can see further little temple areas over there. If you sort of zoom in a bit. I mean, what's this? This looks like it's all been carved out of solid rock. So what was going on there, we don't know. It could have had some practical purpose. It's got a small bowl in front of it. Um, and here we even have, we have very large stones as well. And this one's got striations in it as well, suggesting this could have been, this is evidence of how they worked with the stone. So overall, Tarshan is an amazing megalithic temple site, don't get me wrong, it's a definite must-see for any real megalithomaniac who wants to see the megaliths of the Mediterranean. Um, the connections I find with the spirals, with the serpents, um, with the cut marks and with the little niches that look like they're from other countries and the relief carvings of the bulls and the precision engineering we find here does resemble Gebekli Tepe and it does resemble the sites uh, in South America as well and in Egypt so and especially with the carvings of the boats now that have come to light uh, we, there is more evidence that diffusionism was going on in prehistory and the Maltese temples were part of that great global culture. Mm -hmm.